We're here to empower high income earners to gain back control of your time through financial independence and stop trading your time for money and start letting your money work harder for you. And hey, if you want to meet other high income earners on their FIRE journey, join our High Income Earners FIRE Facebook group. Every month we'll have guest speakers and we'll share about what our team is currently working on and allow you to share what you are working on with other high income earners. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the High Income Earners FIRE podcast. I'm your host, Eileen Prack, joined by Cody Ye. And today our guests are Victor and Lee Leite, and they are co-founders of 258 Capital, a real estate investment firm focusing on multifamily syndications. They have over six years of successful real estate investment experience where they flipped over 150 homes to date. They've now transitioned into the multifamily space and have acquired and operated over $25 million worth of multifamily assets in 2022. They both attended the George Washington University School of Medicine and have been practicing clinicians for the past 12 years. And through real estate, they have been able to generate enough passive income to leave their full-time W-2 jobs in medicine. So Victor and Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, guys. Welcome to the show. (laughs) So Victor and Lee, can you guys share a little bit more about your background and then share a little bit about maybe the three vehicles that you guys have utilized to be able to get to your financial independence? Yeah, I'd love to share some about our background and kind of our story of how we got started on this path. Victor and I met when we were in medical school together and we graduated, got our first jobs, and we were in just a mountain of school debt. So we decided to work really hard to pay those off. And we're working 60 hour weeks, 80 hour weeks, sometimes 100 hour weeks. And finally, we paid off that debt over about a three year period. But in the process, we had burnt ourselves totally out. So we decided just try to get something more out of life than work. So we put in our notice to our jobs. We packed up all of our belongings into a storage facility and we took off for a year long backpacking trip across South America and Southeast Asia. And during that trip, we just had the time of our lives and we really, truly felt that there was more to life than working 40 hour weeks in a clinic for the rest of our lives or until the age of 65 when people retire. And so we got back and we knew we had to find an alternative and we got back to our jobs in medicine and we bought our first single family home. We bought our first home for ourselves. And the day that we moved in, the day we got our closing keys, the day we got our stuff, we opened the door and we found that the whole entire first floor of that house was flooded. So this was was our, (laughs) yeah, totally devastating. And, and that was our introduction to real estate. Yeah, it was a devastating time. We didn't know what to do. It was our first time home buyers. You guys can imagine yourselves in that stage with putting all of our money and savings and getting our first property. And then we were just devastated to to get there. And, and it just kind of our hearts and our mouths just dropped. And, and so that was kind of like the first initial opening into the this entire kind of uh, process that we've been through over the last six or seven years. Um, And now we've kind of grown into a firm now and investing in not just single family, but multifamily. We think that's one of the, the most wonderful vehicles that we've so far have experienced that has really generated great passive income, great cash flow, and really allowed us to create wealth and legacy for our families. Wow. First of all, my dad's practicing medicine and he's still working to this day. So that's really the reason why this podcast has come about is because I want more people like himself to listen to right. it a lot earlier. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'll send this episode to him. <laughs> In medicine, we're, we're just trained. I mean, we're just trained. And anybody can, can attest to that. We're trained. We're the wounded warriors, right? So we're trained, you know, to work 60, 80 hour work weeks, work nights, work holidays, work during birthdays and special events because it's one of the four requirements of life, right? It's food, shelter, health, and I guess now it's power, right? We need power. Mm-hmm. So it's one of the four requirements of life. So that's probably why he's still working because most most of us out there are still working just because it's our passion and we go in it with our passion and we just are trained to really just not complain and just help mm-hmm. others and not think of ourselves. 
But sometimes mm-hmm. you have to shift your mindset. But isn't it interesting too, especially in these high paced, high stress type of environments, it's almost a badge of honor when you're putting in those long hours, those extra times, because it's your calling. It's what you're set out to do to help other people and to serve them. So people put out those extra hours, those long times. Um, and then eventually like the two of you, they burn themselves out because there's no more left to give. Exactly. And all of these physicians, highly trained professionals are really experts in their field, but they're really not experts in financial education and investment vehicles. And you really have to go out of your way to set up that foundation for yourself. Most people just work these hours, keep working kind of on this you know, rat race assuming that their 401k will take care of them. And that's when they end up working till they're 75, 80 years old, Mm -hmm. because it's really not the case. Oh yeah. And the financial literacy, you know, I mean, we work a a lot of our partners and investors are in healthcare and don't get me wrong, highly educated folks, but sometimes just poor financial literacy, not understanding Mm -hmm. that although you're a high income earner, it's Mm -hmm. not what you make is what you keep. And Mm -hmm. you're starting later in your life because of all the schooling, training, and such that you have to go through. So, you know, you have to focus on when are you going to consider yourself retired? Do you have your outcome driven goal that sets the timeline of your retirement? Most people can't even answer that when we talk about it. They don't even know like what I'm envisioning. It's just not something that they think about on a daily basis. So it's kind of one of our, our, our goals and passions is to just educate folks on what we do, what we invest in, what we believe in, because we've been successful at it and we feel like anybody else can do it. You just have Mm -hmm. to just know the processes and just be motivated to go after it. I think that one thing that really impressed me is that you guys did it together. Mm -hmm. You guys, both physicians, both on the same page and you guys did it together. So like if we start from the beginning, once you guys finished medical school, you mentioned that it took you guys three years to pay off all that debt. And then you guys went on the trip for a year and then you bought your first house. Like, how does, can you give us a little bit more detail on that? What were you guys thinking? And cause that's very different, right? I know the paying off that side is probably similar to a lot of other physicians who are investing, but what were you guys thinking? Uh, why do you guys have that confidence to say, you know what, pay off, quit for a year. Like, what were you guys thinking at that point? I think a lot of people, once they get that first job, that first taste of real money, they want to spend it. They want that nicer house. They want that nicer car. They want that nicer lifestyle. And we just always had this larger, broader outcome-driven goal. So we lived in a horrible apartment. It was small. It was below our means. We shared like one beat up car. I was walking to work or taking the bus, you know, a lot of self-sacrifice in order to do that. And working those hours was also a lot of self-sacrifice. But if you really start with the goal in mind, then you know how to get there. Right. If you have no outcome in mind, you'll, you'll never get there. And big bucket list was really to travel the world. And we were young, you know, we didn't have kids yet and it just had to get done. Right. And we set the roadmap. And a lot of people don't have the roadmap. But we talk about outcome driven goals is that, you know, you don't show up to the airport and just say, where are we going? <laughs> no, you're going to have like your tickets and your flight booked and your hotel and your bags. No, you don't just show up and say, where are we going? No, you have an outcome driven goal of where your destination is going to be. So when Lee and I have been on the same page of it's just setting our roadmap for our financial freedom, for our family, for our legacy. And when we talked about in the beginning, you know, debt was one of them. It's a liability. We always talked about, we need to decrease our liabilities or else we'll be always just our head just above water. Mm -hmm. And so we focused on both of us saying, hey, let's live below our means, delay our gratification, and let's get out of this high debt that we're in for our education, right? That we paid for, we've earned, and that's great. But the debt itself was one of the checkoffs before we even did anything like take a sabbatical and take a year off. So we focused on our liabilities first because we thought that that would really keep us from not reaching that financial freedom goal that we had ultimately in mind. Exactly. We could never leave for a year if we had student loan payments to make. So it it just had to leave. And, and to be fair, now we love debt. It's one of our <laughs> favorite investment vehicles, actually. It's just good debt instead of bad debt. <laughs> so how do you guys support yourself for that year? You guys pay off your student debt, but you quit your, both of you guys quit your job. So how do you guys 
support that one year of traveling. Maybe, uh, you know, Ali and I should consider that. <laughs> and, and you guys were able to buy your first house too yeah. during that time. So what are we missing here? <laughs> well, you know, we traveled on a shoe string. Yeah, we traveled on a shoe string, guys. We didn't go to like high, high end, you know, uh, five-star hotels. We wanted to travel, not to vacation. Yeah. We wanted to experience the culture, the food, the people, and have those moments ingrained in our, in our hearts and minds. So we focused on the experience, um, the locations, you know, and that's why we traveled South America. We travel all South America because I'm originally from Brazil. And so mm -hmm. being, having the language skills there throughout South America was great. A lot of our bucket list got reached. And then when we went to Southeast Asia, fantastic yeah. culture, fantastic food, and it's not that expensive yeah. if you know how to travel well. It's yeah. very yeah. equatable to us dollars. So, and we had a roadmap and we had our plan and we, you know, we stayed below our means and we didn't, you know, we had some great moments and memories and don't get me wrong. We did spend some money on doing some fantastic activities, mm -hmm. but it was like more of like a splurge. Like uh, this, is this moment worth it? Do we need yeah. to dive with sharks? Yes, we do. So we go <laughs> with sharks, you know, it's like, do we, do we need to hike, you know, you know, Iguazu Falls? Yes, we did. We did those things because we thought that that was a great bucket list that some people will never do in their lifetimes. Yeah. And so we thought, you know, but then we focused on, you know, we, we focused on our health, our, not just our physical health, but our mental health, our spirituality. We try to focus on things like that, that just made us overall our wellness better. And so we, we really traveled that way. And obviously we saved a little bit of chunk of money to travel. We didn't just show up and, and have no plan. We had our budget for it. We had contingencies. And thankfully we had a little bit of extra to put down on our first home and very, very fortunate that we had high income jobs to allow us to do that. Yeah. We actually worked until we had that nest egg built up because we always planned on coming back and, and buying a home. So we set that money aside and then set our trip money aside. And that was our budget. And we did not go over the budget. And I remember days of traveling where, you know, we'd be like, well, you know, we've got $3 left to eat dinner. Let's make it work. Right. And <laughs> Let's get some and, bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went pretty far, you know, in, in some countries. So oh, yeah. it, it was fine. Oh, yeah. So was it all just savings or did you have to tap into like some 401k retirement funds as well? Or is it just all saved up income? Well, so yeah, great, great question. So at that time we had a majority of it was savings, but we also tapped in some of the stocks that we saw were rising very quickly at that time. And that was what, 2010? No, 2013. So, you know, we, we had some, 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 blue chip stocks that we said, you know what, let's liquidate this thing, utilize this capital. We had a lot of savings. We decided not to tap into any of our retirement accounts at that time, because we believe that we needed to have our retirement separate from this entire thing. And we set the line, we set the, the goal, right? The goal is to make sure we have a wonderful experience, but not at the cost of our future selves. And so we set that plan, that base that way. And we didn't execute our plan until we reached that goal of keeping that money there. Well, like every time we ask a question, we just keep getting all those golden nuggets coming out. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, we have some cash on the knee for our bed as well. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I donate some blood, sort of kidney. <laughs> it's well, it's all the protein from those bugs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you guys travel, okay. Graduate from medical school work three years to pay off, save some money for your first house, quit the job, but kind of still keep that title. So the bank still allow you to buy your first house. Right. Now, what were you guys drinking or eating at that point? Because none of my <laughs> physician friends have that kind of mindset. So like, what's the secret? Like my dad definitely don't have that kind of mindset. So what have you guys been drink, drinking or eating? Really? I think I just never wanted to work the rest of my life. And I wanted to start living now. A okay. lot of people wait to start living till they retire. But at that point, I mean, you don't know how your health will be. You don't right. know what your situation will be. I think you just can't wait and you have to start living. And, and that was my mindset. Let's start living a good life great life right away. Why does it have to be later? Yeah. And Cody, don't forget, like we've seen a lot of death and dying, right? And we've mm -hmm. been in, by people's uh, bedsides when their mm -hmm. last breaths are taken. Yeah. And, and we bring them out of sometimes of that last breath and they, yeah. they live a little bit longer than they pass. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I've had some of these insightful talks sometimes with, with some of the people that I've, I've met in my life. And there's always regret. There's always regret about something, but it's not regret about, man, I regret not buying that Ferrari or man, <laughs> I regret you know, not getting a facelift. No, it wasn't that. It was more of like, I, re- I regret not recognizing the special moments and in our lives and the opportunities that we had when we were young. I regret not spending more time with my loved ones and really fighting and bickering over the small things. We all have regrets and we all have consciousness and things like that. But a lot of that resonated with me a lot. And I talked to Leah about that still to this day. It's like, we have to recognize the moments that we're in you know, and, and try to at least center your focus on it for, for just a moment so that, that you can just cherish it, right? Most people are in the rat race. Most people, and I speak from healthcare because this is all I've done for the last 20 some odd years, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When you're in that environment, that is all you know, right? You surround yourself by a lot of high um, educated people helping other people's worst days of their lives in a high stress environment. So mm-hmm. everything's stress, stress, stress. You don't have time to think, hmm, mm-hmm. you know, what am I going to eat? No, you don't have a lunch. You just eat when you can. Or you yeah. don't even think about, can I make it to my, 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 my daughter's soccer game? No, it's not important right now because someone right now needs you more than yeah. that. You forget about your own personal needs, wants, and desires because your energy, your soul, your mind, your brain is focused on that person in front of you, that mm-hmm. next patient in front of you that needs your help there. This is the worst days of their lives. And so that's why in healthcare, I believe a lot of us don't really think that way. Just, we don't, we're not trained that way. We're focused in a different matter. It sounds like because also the high stress and the time that's included, you don't have any time for yourself and the freedom to let yourself think and just focus a little bit about your own health and your own mental stability and what you guys want to focus on because you're focusing on other people. Exactly. Exactly. And this was, you know, a great experience of how we got started, but now our mindset has really shifted in the way that we got to financial freedom and this path moving forward. So when we started out, we really had this kind of savings mindset, Mm -hmm. Um, live below your means, save as much as you can. And now really what we're trying to do is leverage our time, leverage our money and, and really live a big life while reaching those goals instead Mm -hmm. of living a small life while reaching those goals. And I think that's really the key to reaching that buyer status that you want to maintain an excellent life. You don't want to have self-suffering to get there. Right. That's very amazing. I think people who make that choice, that transition, understand what you're talking about, but I think most physicians, including other income, high income earners are kind of still on the original side of things just save more. They kind of spend on things that they don't really need. Right. Um, so that's, that's very, very, it takes a lot of courage to start, you know, leverage your time. That means you get to spend more money on maybe hiring people, have a team, right? Start outsourcing a lot of the things that it's not the highest and best use of your time, right? But it's very scary because your expense just goes up and drains up all your cash flow, right? And, you know, I'm going through that stage and, you know, a lot of time it's kind of scary too, but I know in order to live the fullest, and spend your time on the highest and best use of growing your portfolio, other business, you have to kind of go through that, right? So how do you guys overcome that kind of fear? And I think that's a fear for a lot of high income earners. Like, should I go out and practice by myself? Should I, you know, hire a few more physician? Uh, should I open my own clinic? You really have to take a step back and look at what is the true value of your time? If you're doing a task that you could pay somebody else $10 an hour to do, is your time only worth $10? Is your time worth $100? How much is your time actually worth? And if your time is not worth that task, then you should leverage it out. For example, are you spending three or four hours a week doing yard work and cutting the lawn when you could hire that out for a lot less? And then what could you accomplish if you had laser vision focus on your future self for three to four hours a week. Right. You could probably accomplish a lot with that time. And that's what I mean by leveraging your time. Yeah. And everybody, including us at some point, you have to work through those self-limiting beliefs and anxieties. 
because you want to stay in control as much as you can. But sometimes if you're trying to wear 10 different hats, you're really not going to move your vehicle forward. And by vehicle, I mean your, your fire status, your retirement goal forward, unless you try to find the team or build a team in place that's going to get you there faster, more efficiently, less stressful. You know, what we usually talk about is our productivity pyramid. You know, we look at our different tasks that we require to do on a daily basis. We base it off of four colors. And this is something that we, we got from our, of our mentor, Trevor McGregor. You know, he really built it into our head, like goal tasks. What are your goal tasks, guys? Like, what do you fo- focus on gold? What is your goal? Meaning priceless tasks, right? My, my priceless task is time with my wife, time to take care of my health, uh, time with my kids right? You can't, there's not, nothing you can pay me to give away that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then we focus on dark green tasks. The dark green tasks are that high per hour rate, whatever number you want to set that at a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand dollars an hour. Those are the big ideas things, right? And you focus on these, on this task to grow and scale your business or venture. Light green tasks are the less lesser of tasks that may or may not require you to do it, but at some point it does. I don't know, uh, meetings, uh, discussions, financial, stuff like that. And then these brown tasks that my wife was talking about, you know, landscaping or um, laundry, laundry, cleaning, <laughs> cleaning um, answering emails, uh, paying bills, watching TV, watching TV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Everybody does it and it's not wrong. And every day is different but we really try to retrain ourselves to set our lives with productivity pyramid so that at the end of the day, we've really accomplished a lot. Mm -hmm. We've really accomplished a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you really have, you guys have flipped over 150 homes. You guys have purchased multifamily properties over $20 million in 2022 alone. So walk us through that journey. Like, how did you guys build up? How are you able to accumulate and be able to flip all those houses with the income that you had? And what kind of strategies did you utilize in order to generate the income? You know, and how did you roll it over into the next investments? I mean, it all starts with one, right? So we started with that first uh, opportunity that we had with our single uh, for our first time home. And we had a devastating situation, but we regrouped and we kind of built a supporting cast around us to really get that property renovated to the point that we we decided to put it on the market and it sold for profit. And so we took that profit and we rolled it into the next opportunity. And that second opportunity, we rinsed and repeated it and we gain some more profit. But then with our strategies of, of it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep, we thought to ourselves, well, not only are we still working W-2 jobs and making high income, but now we're fixing and flipping and, and potentially getting hit with short-term capital gains taxes. We thought to ourselves, man, we need to shelter some of this and mm-hmm. find another strategy. And that's how we started with you know our first buy and hold. We call it our burr, our first burr. And if you want me to go in details, I'll tell you guys about that one. I mean, it's really nitty gritty. I mean, we bought a three bedroom, one and a half bath property that nobody wanted in a B class neighborhood, which is kind of like your middle class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It was vacant for six months. We got that property for (laughs) $50,000. <laughs> um, unheard of in California. <laughs> right. You, you're not, well, you can't, no, it's unheard of anywhere, anywhere. right now, <laughs> but we got that property for $50,000. The teams that I used to help us with the fix and flip side said, Hey, you guys want some extra work? You no, know, it's just more of like a, a buy and hold. We're going to rent it. Yeah. Great. Okay, cool. We spent $8,000 on it on the renovation process. And we, we did a great job. New kitchen, new bath. New, I mean, this was some years back. So new kitchen, new bath, new flooring paint, yada, yada, yada. We really did a nice little job on that property. We got it rented within two weeks after we finished it for $1,200. Okay. We bought it in cash and that's how the Burr strategy works. You buy it, right? You Mm -hmm. renovate it, you rent it, you refinance it and you repeat. So we bought it in cash and we had to wait six months. And that's the key factor there. Mm -hmm. There is a seasoning period 
for all normal banks seasoning period for six months before mm-hmm. you can refinance your money. Yeah. They want you so to then, stabilize it. Right? Yeah. They want you to stabilize yeah. it. You have no record or proof yep. of you've done it before. You have no history, credibility, yada, yada. So we, gosh, it was so hard to get a loan back then because we had to go to the smaller credit unions and things like mm-hmm. that because nobody believed in us because we had no record or history yeah. of anything. Right. Yeah. But we found a bank that believed in us, gave us a great rate. We refinanced that property in six months mm-hmm. for $135,000. So we literally got paid to do that. And then we took those net proceeds and we just did it again and then again and again. So we used real estate as our compounding effect and we did burr after burr and then two burrs turned into four burrs. And then we started developing a burr, a single family portfolio that we still have to this day, still renting out. It's great. And I still have that $50,000 property. Now it's being rented for like, I don't know, 16, 1700. They love to be there and we're just cash flowing all day long. And it sounds too good to be true, but we had no experience. You know, we had no, like, I don't know, book to follow, to do this. Mm -hmm. We just took a leap of faith. Obviously we educated ourselves. We took a leap of faith. We found the right teams around us and we just started Mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So you were able to utilize the Burr method to continue to purchasing the next properties, rolling in the proceeds that you made, the refinance aspect of it. And in addition to that, you were also still working your W-2 jobs. So you're also bringing in active income from your W-2 as well. And are you saving that money? Are you also investing it to, I guess, enhance and to grow faster? We were investing that money as well. And a big game changer was actually when one of us left the W-2 job and got the real estate professional status because when you have that status for the tax advantage, you're really able to take advantage of the passive losses, the depreciation that you get from rental properties. So that accelerated us forward even more, actually leaving the W-2 job, leaving the high earning W-2 job, like just catapulted us to another level, which you wouldn't think that'd be the case, but it was. Why do you think that catapult you guys to the next level by quitting a both W-2 job, both physician job, or, you know, practicing medicine job? Well, we were able to really start taking advantage of the real estate's potential with those tax savings. And also we were able to become laser focused on this outcome driven goal. We were able to really devote that time to get to that next level. And that's when, you know, our portfolio just blew up from maybe 20 single family homes to 160 doors when we got that focus really dialed in. Yeah. Right. I mean, don't forget, I mean, you're still working W2 jobs and it's not a, you know, it's not a nine to five, it's 40, 40, 50 hour work weeks. And you don't have time to focus on other avenues of investing because you're focused on your primary you know, job. Once we were able to step down and we had enough passive income coming through to step down. Mm-hmm. We said, you know what? Let's focus, laser focus on getting the scalability of this, move it into a stratosphere that we weren't before. So, kind of like productivity pyramid that I talked about, it's that dark green time. So, we took away a dark green time and replaced it with a dark green time that allowed us to even scale further. What is your vision or what is your interpretation of retirement looks like? Because you left a W-2 job where you're working actively and now you've transitioned into real estate full time where you're also working. Like, What's the difference and what is the vision of what retirement looks like? I think really retirement is not a specific number and it's really individualized for everybody's circumstances. And it's really when your passive income exceeds your expenses. And when that happens, that means you're not reliant on an active job. Mm -hmm. So we're not reliant on any active job and we choose to do this because we love it. And that means we get to do it on our own terms when we want. And so even though, you know, we're not sitting down on a beach, you know, just hanging out, we are still in a sense working, but it's on our own terms. That's well said. Now, if you guys look back, building from one door to 160 doors, what if, if you guys look back, what are the three skills? What are the three things you guys should have focused on? Or maybe you guys were focusing on what are the three things or the three key power team people that you guys were like, we should have nailed those or you guys nailed those. 
think one of the biggest things was mastering leverage. And I had to initially get comfortable with debt. I had this mentality from before of debt was bad. I wanted to pay off my student loans. And I had to shift my mentality that debt was actually really, really good, especially when it comes to real estate. Are you talking about mortgage debt or business debt or? Mortgage debt. Okay, mortgage debt. Because if you hold, you know, a $200,000 property in cash, yes, it cash flows great. But what if you could take out you know, $180,000 from that property. And what could you do with that money? Well, you can Mm -hmm. buy more real estate Mm -hmm. and then you can do it again. And then you can do it again and you can refinance out and take commercial lines of credit and even buy more real estate. And in this whole entire process, all of those properties that you have are cash flowing, they're appreciating, Mm -hmm. and they're just building your generalized wealth. So in that sense, debt is good. It helps you grow. How do you create good debt because some people, when they're looking at real estate, sometimes they talk about this thing of over being over leveraged. How do you balance the being over leveraged and making sure that you guys are doing the right things so that you're not over leveraged and you're actually protecting yourselves in case of something were to happen later down? So the number one rule is it must cash flow. And if you have that cash flow to cover all of the, that debt and more, then it should be good. You never want to take out more debt than you can actually cover. And also, we always hold a big just working capital contingency. Is right. there a rule of thumb you guys look at? Six months of rent or is there a certain percentage of the purchase price or how do you guys hold that contingency? Yeah, we used to use the one or the 2% rule, whatever. I mean, you can't find 2% rulers usually anymore, but the 1% rule we used in the beginning um, because we didn't have any understanding of calculations and looking at it. Right now, we're really looking at more of the internal rate of returns, the Mm -hmm. IRRR is what Mm -hmm. they call it, because Mm -hmm. sometimes the IRR is better than your cash on cash return because sometimes you can't calculate what value you can put into a real estate property. It's hard to calculate. The IRR kind of puts that into more of a calculated form and shows you your overall return Mm -hmm. at the end. And so we started looking at more of the internal rate of returns when we look at these investments, instead of just putting rules of thumbs. But the rules of thumbs helped us in the beginning because one, we weren't sophisticated as we are now with our calculations. And it kind of just kept us from getting in trouble. And we just focus on letting the property cash flow then you can sleep at night because your debt to service, your insurance, your, you know, your interest, everything's going to be covered. And then don't forget, it's not just the cash flow, but it's depreciation of the property and the depreciation benefits that you get from it. There's a lot more benefits than just a cash flow benefit. But if it cash flows, then you should be okay. Awesome. And where do you guys find those? Cash flow property now. Are you guys still focusing on the same area that you guys built up the 160 unit or are you guys shifting around now? Yeah, no. So yeah. So the one biggest lesson that we learned that we kind of focus on now is just just scaling, right? The scaling of where we were to where we are now. And we focused on, you know, we still do single family investments, but we're really focusing on the multifamily side because the scaling potential of that is just so much greater. Mm-hmm. And so we focused our energies in certain markets within our area. We're in the state of Virginia. So Mm -hmm. state of Virginia, state of North Carolina, are actually very, very solid markets right now to focus on where not everybody and everybody's fund is in, right? All the famous headline grabbing states like Texas and Indiana. Georgetown, Florida. (laughs) Yeah, Florida. Yeah, we, we step away from that. There's too many fishes in that pond. Real estate is hyper local. Mm -hmm. So there is opportunity everywhere. You just have to understand your hyper local market and have relative numbers, right? Mm-hmm. And I always say that we're not looking for home runs, we're looking for base hits because base hits lead you to financial freedom a lot smoother. And in the long scheme, you'll be in the game a lot further than taking a lot of big swings and striking out. Awesome. Well, Victor and Lee, we're coming up here on some time here and we want to, you know, we can continue having this conversation with you forever because there's just so much in there that we can deep dive into, into your backgrounds. And you guys have shared so much information with us today, but we're going to start off with the lightning round. If you guys are ready for that. Ready. Let's go. All right. So the first one is if you become a billionaire tomorrow, a billionaire, what would your day look like? 
It's a great question. I think my day would look similar to what it is now. I'd wake up in the morning, I would work out, I would spend time with my children. We help others all the time. We help others with education. We help others with investments. We help others with their problems. I mean, you have to have purpose, right? I think Mm -hmm. our lives need purpose for it to be valued at the end of the day. So I think we'd probably be similar. I would probably take a few more vacations flying first class. (laughs) So no No more more. more living on a shoestring. No, no more shoestrings or backpacks. I think we'll be okay. No more coach to Bali. Um, How about about bugs? How about bugs? I'll I'll still try some bugs. I'm an adventurous eater. I've eaten a lot of weird stuff that we're not going to talk about, but, but it's a part of the experience, right? So it's memorable. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. That's a great answer. Now, the next question will be, if you guys lose everything, but you guys still have the skills and the knowledge you guys have, and somehow half a million dollar drop from the sky, how will you guys start that your journey right now, knowing what you know with half a million dollars? I would go immediately to multifamily just with the economy of scale and, you know, dust yourself off and take what you have and make some solid investments with high returns and start accumulating that cash flow and that passive income right away. If that would happen to us right now, I would definitely like the key factor is, is getting your team together, right? Getting the people in place that will allow for you to succeed even faster, further, and with higher probability of success than doing it all by yourself. You know, most people just start all by themselves, but don't realize that there's a lot of help out there, assistance, partnering, leveraging, you know, you have a lot to offer. Everybody's got a superpower. So don't be afraid of partnering. And I don't want to say piggybacking, but connecting with others that are already successful and just go with that momentum, surround yourself by these folks, and you're just going to raise your level of what success means. Yeah. So that's why I partner with Adeline to start this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I'm leapfrogging on her shoulder. Smart man. We're we're, we're leveraging each other's skills. Yes. Yeah. So if you were also to have a podcast yourself and you were looking for people to interview and you could choose anybody in the world that you wanted to interview, who would that be? Let's see, I just saw Ken Kiyosaki speak at a conference and I just loved what she had to say. And I would love to continue that conversation with her. She's part of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad empire, which is what we really base our life off of, which is instead of giving your time away, working a W-2, you accumulate assets, which then give you cash flow. So just kind of that different mindset in the first place. That's so cool. Just in case you have a contact to her, then (laughs) or for you. (laughs) We're welcoming that too. (laughs) We're leveraging. (laughs) And besides everything that you guys are doing, what are some of the ways that you guys are giving back? Some people is monetary. Some people put in time. Some people, some are putting, you know, like YouTube videos. How are you guys uh, kind of giving back in your own way? Yeah. So. We focus a lot, like we're heavily invested in real estate and we focus on our real estate kind of umbrella. And so we we do a lot of mentoring, educating. We're really focusing on putting out some more educational content, more like actionable steps content instead of anything like kind of overview. We try to really educate you know, the folks that really work with together closely. We, We send out newsletters and blogs and we do a little bit of of content video production so that they can see, meaning like when we're renovating a large apartment than which we are now, you know, I'll do some video content, explain them. Why are we doing the kitchens? Why, where's the value in this opportunity? How does that add a, you know, net operating income return for the property? Why do we not do this? Why should we do this? We go over how do, you know, what are the four strategies you can implement right now, right? to give your kids a heads up in life. People don't even think about that. Like, you know, our, our kids are three and five and they're already investors. They have self-directed IRAs. They have 529s and they're educated. They know mommy and daddy are going to the apartment buildings. Let's go look. They're in all of our kind of like uh, content platforms because we literally strive to set the standard for our family and our legacy. And our kids already are going to be set in the right trajectory, because that's something that we didn't have. At least Lee and I, you know, we come from blue collar families. Like they just don't, just don't think that way. Mm -hmm. And it's okay not to think that way, but we're going to be just a little bit different and just trigger a little bit of a different path for them and a roadmap for them. And hopefully we'll give them, you know, a chance to continue the legacy on. 
Yeah, Victor and I are really big about the give, give, give mentality. And it's really not a competition, especially in the real estate world. I think everybody really wants to help each other. And I think the saying is that a rising river raises all boats. So if you just try to raise up everybody around you, then you'll rise up too. And it's just important to give back to others. Awesome. Well, Victor and Lee, we really enjoyed the conversation with you two today. I mean, what you guys have been doing is incredible and how you've been able to build up everything, change your mindset, um, still are able to give back. And I know, Victor, you still practice also some as a physician as well. And so it's incredible. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all that you have today with us. And so for our listeners also who want to learn more about you guys, where's the best place that they can go to find out more about you two? You can go to our website. Our company is called 258 Capital, and that is www.258cap.com. You can also reach out to us at info at 258 cap and follow us on Instagram at 258 underscore cap, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, Facebook, we're, we're everywhere. We're really trying to put out a little bit of kind of like a balance between educational content, kind of lifestyle, informative content, a little bit of day in the life. So people can see like, we're just regular people and we're mm-hmm. open and we're not really, you know, you shouldn't be scared to talk to us. We're just kind of uh, out there just giving as much as we can to educate the people around us and raise everybody around us. Love it. Love it. Well, thanks again for having you guys on. I really enjoy this episode just from the beginning to the end. That's why I keep asking the questions that go all over the place. Usually I'm not like this at Lee knows, but I'm just like so fascinated. So um, thanks for coming on. We're probably going to have you come on probably later down the road for you guys to update us on your hundred million or maybe $1 billion <laughs> portfolio. <laughs> True. Yes, we'd love to. It's it's really a journey. So we didn't think we'd be here five years ago. So we'll see yeah. where we are in, in five years from now. Great. Well, that concludes our episode for today. All the links mentioned in this episode are included in the show notes. And if you love this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. The link is also included in the show notes. And we would really appreciate your help in spreading the word to more high income earners on how they too can maximize both their time and money. Also, if you still haven't joined our high income earners Facebook group, you are missing out on high income earners community where we help each other reach our own version of fire. 